I'm going to talk today about uh, my experience with developing business resilience. It's by no means instruction to the group as to what you should do, it's just what I have done and um, my experience. So I thought if I spoke frankly and openly about my experience and what I find useful, then perhaps um, that will also generate some discussion or there might be something that you would like to take away from it. Um, and the reason for me being here, just as a little aside, is I've always um, been a great admirer of the whole uh, land care group and whole in general. Um, some of you know, may know, and Phil and I were speaking about this morning, we've uh, leased the property at Mount Creek for 20 years now, or a bit over 20 years, and we've really enjoyed uh, as a business, not only the um, activity of running the farm there, but also our interaction with the locals, and, and as I say, I've admired what the whole land care group it's done over a very long period, so um, hence my uh, hence my uh, enthusiasm to come and hopefully give a little bit back to the group. So I thought I'd just start with a so that I give you the context of my comments today. I just give you a pricey of um, my business or our business, I should say. Um, so started at Corolla in the late nineties. Took over the reins well and truly. Well, totally took over the reins in '98, and from there we've expanded to um, have farms in southwest Victoria, uh, northeast Victoria, and on the um, eastern fall of the Monero. So all the people on the Monero don't call us Monero; they call us Eastern Fall, and I'm quite happy to have that demarcation. Um, and the little red dot there is uh, our property that we lease down on Mountain Creek. So we run cattle and sheep, and and predominantly cropping it. About, um, I mean, our livestock enterprise are pretty much 60% uh, weighted towards protein. So I thought we're talking about resilience today, and I thought it'd be really important that we actually define what I consider to be resilience. So um, a couple of the people, one of the companies that we employ to give us help is um, uh, the uh, Metal Group, and they've written a book called uh, The Resilience Shield. I really like the book, but anyway, in the book they define the two elements of, um, of uh, resilience is you have to have a stressor. So this is not about avoiding stress or stress not affecting you. It has to have, yeah, there, it has to be the stressor there, and then you have to have a better than expected outcome from the stressor. So it's not about me saying that I don't feel stressed, because I do, and it's not about me saying that I don't have conflict in my workplace, because I do. It's not about me saying that I don't get upset, because I do, but it's about saying we, um, you know, we acknowledge it, we walk towards it, and then we come out of it at the end um, better than we thought we would. So obviously the stress is there, that's the photo of um, the bushfires that we all went through, I think you guys all did too. Fortunately, that's the part of the fire that killed the people on the south coast, but that had just gone to the north of our boundary, but that's an example of a stress event. Uh, I've broken the point, have There we go. So I thought what I'd talk to you about is the characteristics of what I think is a Brazilian business, but then, and, and I don't want to labor that too much, because what I was hoping to spend a little bit of time on is the how. You know, it's a very broad topic, resilience. Um, it's a bit like culture, it gets thrown around as a bit of a cliche. But resilience and culture and all these things, uh, they make up such a, so much of our day-to-day -day life that it's easy to, it's easy to ignore it because it becomes part of the furniture. I don't know if you've heard the joke about the two fish swimming in the ocean, and the third fish comes the other way and goes, how's the water, boys? And swims off, and the first fish turns to the second fish and goes, what's he talking about? No idea. So you know, it's around us and we're submerged in it, but we don't often stop to acknowledge it. So, I was just going to talk so this is some specific examples on how we got better at resilience. So the characteristics of a resilient business, in my, my mind, some of the big ones are you've got to be profitable. It's really hard to be resilient if um, the wolf's at the door. And you've got to be really good at, at making um, decision making and making plans. And then you've got to go back and reassess your past behaviour and your past planning and what have you. And then also you have to have um, a team that's on board and it's also um, with you. So it's one thing I have found in our growth, it's one thing when you operate your own farm, then able to push that as hard as you can, but then when you're leveraging off um, 
other farms and the people who are managing your farms for you, it becomes more and more difficult and that piece about the human resource becomes more and more important, or has done in my experience. So we'll just start with profitability. Oh, oh well, go the wrong way. So I'll just start with profitability. Oh, oh, here we go. Now I don't want this to be, um, I'm not going to give you chapter and verse on profitability, I'm just going to give you my experience because as you're all aware, um, there's plenty of people that can talk to um, profitability in greater detail than I can and I look around the room and I see the collective knowledge here is people here that are, you know, well they say, has everyone heard of imposter syndrome? As one of my friends says to me, Charlie, it's not a syndrome if you are actually an imposter. So I don't, um, <laughs> I don't want to um, lecture you, but I'm just going to go through the, the points that I found good in our business. So low cost of production. Obviously, uh, when prices are high, there's numerous models of production that uh, are profitable, but when prices are low, it's only the low cost people that do well. So um, we put a lot of emphasis on our cost of production. Know your own numbers. So what do they say? Comparison is the thief of happiness. It's your numbers, you stay in your bubble, you stay in your lane. And so there are plenty of farmers, for example, I stayed with Tom Bull last night, that guy's inspiring, going around his business. You know, he would belt me out of the park when it comes to profitability, but that doesn't matter. I know my numbers, so I know what farms I can buy at my hurdle rate. It doesn't, you cannot do your due diligence vicariously by saying, well, Sandy Middleton bought that farm for $10 million, I bought an equivalent farm for nine and a half, therefore I'm going better. Sandy's probably better at it than me, he's going to make a better return. So you've got to know your own numbers. Um, know the trends in your business. So one number in one area of your business once is not as powerful as a trend over a decade because you want to know the direction you're going. It enables you to see where your strengths are and where your weakness is occurring. Um, and one of the things I've observed between the really good businesses, the people that are going forward and the people that are stagnating, is their ability to invest into um, efficiencies and into, the, into where they're going to be in the future. So they're spending a lot of time making tomorrow better than today and you cannot conjure, you cannot conjure efficiencies and profitability. So you've got to invest in, in all the steak and potatoes here. Um, but I reckon the big one, and I don't want to talk to you about infrastructure and fertilizer and dams and all the rest of it because you guys know more about it than I do, but just to put onto a, um, a bit of a bugbear of mine, human capital. So in my business, or to give you an insight, I've been paying payroll tax for a very long time now. So it's a big chunk of my business goes out in uh, salaries. But yet if I look at the proportion of time and effort I put into training my own people, and I put in more than most people do, it is, way smaller than the um, the rigour that I go through for say our herbicide application or our fertiliser application and what have you yet. You know, our fertiliser and my wages bill are pretty similar, you know, they're over a million dollars each. And yet I put far more rigour into my fertiliser and so that's something that we've been addressing over the last four years is that human res resource and the investment in that. And then I thought I'd just touch on, um, I really like comparative analysis groups. We're in a lot of benchmarking groups and across all the districts. And I also read other people's benchmarking and comparative analysis groups. So I'm always reading the, um, the, the different ones from the different areas. And um, it's not because I want to win. If anything, if you go to a comparative analysis group, the best thing that can happen is to become dead motherless last because as one of my mentors, does anyone know me, voice? Some of the older people in the room, Made it, you know, Voice and Co, they're over there in Yancey. It's a big start of Voice and Co, he's been out long ago. But he was a, a mentor of mine when I started farming, and he used to say to me, find the most successful person in the district and just shamelessly copy them, Charlie. And so I'm a lot of, I'm not that smart, and I'm, but I'm not that proud either, so I'm quite happy to copy whoever's the best in, best in the breed. So one of the things I thought I'd just touch on um, is good decisions and, um, and good planning. So when 
I first started all those years ago, one of my great frustrations is everyone could tell me what you had to do and why you had to do it, but no one can explain to me how I was going to do it. And that was the really hard part. And so um, I think that one of the big differentiating factors in a drought or in a crisis is, um, is people's conviction, the strength of conviction. <clears throat> so my brother, um, he's a very successful, he's a farmer, but he's a very successful share investor as well. And he's, and he's quite open with his advice. He'll tell you, he's got a great knowledge of shares and a great knowledge of businesses and, and of, um, industries. And he'll say to me, I'll share my ideas with you quite happily, but what I can't share with you is my strength of conviction. And, and that's the really, when you see people check out at five minutes to midnight, they've had a policy and at the last minute they change their policy because they haven't had their strength of conviction. The strength of conviction in their decision, even though their decision might have been the right one. And so how do you get that? It's by knowing that you've made your business decisions, your decisions really, really well. And so, uh, I just wanted to talk about how you do that. So um, it's it's very much about knowing your data. And the other thing I was going to hope or that I would share with you today is um, I'm going to do an injustice to the resources that I have found profound in my farming um, career or my business development. So I was, at the end, I'm going to share with you some of the resources on this subject that I've found really helpful. But as we go, so there's a guy called David Stone, he talks about the, the problems you'll encounter in life. And I won't talk to them all today. But, but complicated and complex problems is where a lot of ag problems fall into. So there's no one absolute answer mm -hmm. that works every time. So you, you talk, if you ever, I guess everyone knows Bruce Walls, right? And he gives this great speech about carving day. There's no carving day that works every year year in, year out. You're just going for the carbon date that works more often and exposes you to the less downside. And so Snowden talks about these complex problems and it really resonated to, to me when I first read and listened to his stuff. So in agriculture, you're just trying to bet with the house. So you're trying to work out what the propensity and likelihood is of an outcome and you're trying to bet with the house. So there are times where a, um, there are times where um, for example, take, take autumn carving, which is, seems to be a hot topic, right? What it was when I first came home. So there are times when autumn carving is the most profitable model to go with, but it's not the most often. So you're trying to bet with the most often and have the least downside. Um, similarly, if um, snow is too high level for you, Ross Kimmel from Western Australia, he's an ag economist in Western Australia, and he speaks to and, and I'm glad that um, I'm glad that we were talking about um, uh, decile prices and, and what have you before. So he speaks to um, how we never get, or we rarely in agriculture get that even distribution. So um, when you're at school or at university, and everyone talked about populations as if, as if they were evenly distributed. So if you want to look up any of Kimmel's stuff, it's really interesting because he points out that it's not only the time you spend at decile above 75, to use the example we finished on um, last, it's actually the volume of product that goes out at that decile price. And so you tend to, not always, but you tend to get less product at a higher price. So for example, you think of selling wheat or buying wheat in a drought when there's not much of it around, that tends to be when the price goes up. So to think that prices is evenly distributed, yeah, the prices might be, but the prices by the volume are gone. So what does that mean? That means when you do your budgets, either for expenses or income, you need to bear in mind how likely is it. So sure, prices may go that high, but is the mean and the median of this population close to one another? So you know, the, this, <laughs> this Math, ex math teachers of mine and ex stats lecturers at uni of mine now just screaming and, and rolling in their grave. But um, so, what I'm saying is, you don't want to be assuming that the average is a likely event when the average has been drawn up by a few very large events. And, um, and so, what I'm talking about large events, I'm not talking about, has everyone read um, The Black Swan by, Black Swan by Taylor? 
where he talks about you know these these big unforeseen events coming and just absolutely changing either your industry or humanity or what have you. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things that we know could happen. And so it's, it's not like they're unforeseen things. I'm not asking you to look into a crystal ball. So this is a this is what I could find as best I could. And, and when we just apply this to any population. It just happens to be rainfall, right? So this is as close as you're going to get into ag, I reckon, as an evenly distributed population. So you're trying to make the decision <laughs> At a farm at Lucendale, so our farm is just down here, similar rainfall, etc. And so here we have if you, the mean being the average and the median being the middle school, they're going to be somewhat similar. And then if you break that down into um, the months of the year, you'll see here how reliable these winter months are. So more often than not, if you wanted to do, if you wanted to create a resilient business, and you had to have important things in your business occurring at a time where you really relied on rainfall, well then you would structure it here, right? Because there's a high likelihood that you're not gonna, that you're gonna get the rainfall that you've structured that, that, that part of your enterprise for. However, if we look at, say, a farm at Burren Junction, the average rainfall is only 50 mils less than the one at Lucendale, but look at this massive tail out here. And if we fast forward, oh, if we go over the months, yeah. oh, there we go. Here, look at the gaps between the mean and the median. So you've got big events dragging the average up, but the middle score is still quite low. So that, for mine, if you have a population or, a, or you look, you're examining the data to make your decision, and so take, for example, drought. My drought policy for a farm like this would be far different to that one where you know you, you do spend a significant amount of time down here in the lower mm -hmm. rainfall you know there's 30 30 years here um, you know below 400 mil rainfall and you can take this example this is just for rainfall but you can take it for um, any data set that you look at um, and then the other thing I'd say about when you're trying to make your decisions, you just got to make sure that the data hasn't changed. So here's um, one of the farms that we own in northeast Victoria. And is everyone familiar with GrassGrow, the CSIRO model for pasture production? So this is under my um, husbandry, so my fertiliser regime, my stocking rate, my species. This is what I would expect in the pinch period of the winter. You know, everyone, how tough winters can be in the hills. So pre, from 1961 to 1991, this is what was happening, you know, beginning of June, if we take the, the, the 50th percentile, there's not much pasture growth at all, right? And it takes us almost to the end of August to be climbing out of it. Now, I don't want to get into an argument about whether climate change is true or not. This is just what's happened since 1992 with the warmer, with the warmer um, winters that we've had there. So the beginning of June, you know, at the, the, the 50th percentile, we've got 16 kilos per hectare per day, whereas before we had six and a half. So if you run a DSC to the hectare for every kilo of dry matter, look at the profound difference you've got there. Now sure, winter's still tough in the middle, but it's far more acute because you're coming out of it faster. And then look at the upside, look at the warmer years. Now, you put this in conjunction with a farm that's got 1,100 mil rainfall. So even in the droughts, right, when I drop 400 mils and they're warm winters, that leads to me having a far more resilient business because unlike a lot of the locals up there that said you won't stop it at that because it gets really cold, I went back and said, well, the data has changed. If we take the subset of the data, the more recent stuff, the farm is a far more uh, attractive proposition than it was if I was anchored in the old data. So this is a specific example of data changing, but I guess what I'm saying is when I go and make my decisions, I always make sure that there's no anomaly there. So another example may be if, we're, if I was looking at feed growing, I was going to do my droughts, so I go to, um, does everyone know Andrew Woods from Independent Commodity Services in Wagga? 
So I'll get when I'm wargaming, and we'll talk a bit about wargaming in the next couple of slides. So I'm doing my what ifs. So I go into my drought scenarios with my what ifs, and I get Andrew to drop me all the wheat prices. I disregard a lot of the grain prices when the um, when the wheat boards were in because they distorted the market. And that similarly, when we had the all out from the, the wool board, and so we, you know, we're selling the stockpile, I, I tend to put less weight to those figures in my decision making than the more um, recent wool prices. So the point is, I'm, you know, I hope I'm articulating it well enough, is know your data and make sure that your data hasn't changed. Make sure that you're not, um, you're not falling in love with numbers that are no longer relevant. And then we always like to go back and look at what we've done. So this was our plan and go back and see what was our actual life to our plan. So some of the most obvious ones are budget to actuals. So too often I see um, people use budgets as a one-off thing for their banker that they do, they want to buy a new farm or if um, the bank, if you're running at low equity and the bank wants to see it and you begrudgingly do it, your budget should be a living document. And and, um, and so a budget to actual, I said I'd be here and I'm there. Is that because of better prices, better production, or is that because of more sales than I budgeted on? So is it a timing difference or is it an actual difference? And then what are the ramifications of that? Has my peak debt changed? Am I going to have enough money to spend on urea and what have you? And then even, even better than that, or better than that, more immediate than that, we do debriefs or hot washes. So you'll have every Sunday night, the man, the, the, myself and Owen Smith, I don't know if any of you have met Owen, so Owen's my sergeant at arms, he's in charge of implementing everything on the farm, so all the managers report to Owen <laughs> and Owen reports to me. So every Sunday night we'll send out, this is what we're going to do for the week, but just as importantly, this is what didn't happen last week, and then on the farms, where there's more than one person, which is Oh, not, yeah, which is most of the farms. When we have our, this is a plan for the for this week and next week, we also go, what didn't we achieve last week? Why didn't we achieve it? And what could we do better? Where's the efficiency? So circling back to scrutinize the plan or your objectives from the previous week is far more powerful in my experience <coughs> than just writing a list and giving it to someone because that's where your efficiency gains come from. And also if you have um, a health and safety incident, or if something, if there's something goes really wrong, so you kill a heap of sheep or what have you. So it's a no blame. We're not apportioning blame. We just want to interrogate what what went wrong and what would we do next time to make it better. And so back to the original the second slide. That's you know coming out of something better than you thought you otherwise would. So going back, acknowledging that there was a mistake, or acknowledging there was a stressor event, and saying, well, can I have everyone's feedback? And, um, and let's make it better. And so a tip for that, if you're the boss, so if I go into a room with a meeting, I never talk first. Always make the youngest person or the most junior staff member, team member, not staff member, team member, speak first. Because if I come in and say, I think we cocked up last week because Philip Locke forgot to do to do it, then already, straight away, that's where I've cashed and everyone's like, yeah, like Philip's an idiot, do, 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 they're all firing in. <laughs> whereas, whereas the junior staff member says, oh, listen, I reckon we stuffed up because, you know, Phil's been working flat out. He's done a 90 hour week for the last three weeks in a row. The fact that he forgot to latch the gate, well, that's gonna happen, right? Because you're working as like a dog, we need to have a better system here, blah, blah, blah. So if you're the most senior person in the room or if you're the farm owner, you speak last and you don't put your view onto other people's. But that's how a good hot wash works, I reckon. Um, and then how would you know you were wrong? So it's one thing to have a plan, it's a great, has everyone read um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People? So argue like you're right and listen like you're wrong. So how would I know what I was wrong? How would I know that my model of buying farms here, there and everywhere, as soon as I had enough equity to go again, I was gonna go to the next best farm that I could find regardless of where it was. How would I know that that was wrong? So always go back and examine, is my model still right? You know, get people to criticize you. Um, and I reckon, the big one for me, I have found, is um, I don't have to, my business doesn't have to be the best business, it just has to be getting better. So it's that growth mindset. I, 
I um, it was a really good. I don't know if you guys are into because how many people got kids in the room? No. So there's a really good study done on praising children for the outcome and praising children for the effort, and they break exactly the same population into two groups. And they give one group really easy maths question, and they praise them for constantly getting it right. And then they give the other group really hard maths questions, and they just praise them for the effort. What happens is the ones that get praised for the outcome, they just get so scared of failure that they just don't want to sit in exams anymore. And the ones that get praised for the effort end up being really proficient at because they keep on trying and trying. So in our business, we're very much about praising the effort. You know, the outcome is secondary. You know, we analyze what was our decision making. Could we have done something better in our decision making process? You know, could we have worked harder? Is there some way we could have done it better? But the actual outcome, we don't spend so, so much time on. So war gaming, so we're big on what if. So foot and mouth disease, I don't know how many of you have spoken to your bank already about what would happen with foot and mouth if it came out for your business. I don't know how many of you run around insurance brokers to see if you can get any insurance on disruption. I don't know how many have priced up what you can put your farm down to carbon credits for. You know, so all this scenario running, what if that happens? What would I do? Who do I need to tell? Do I need to tell my team? So when, when um, COVID came out, I rang all my team members and said, I will sell a farm before I, I sack anyone. So you, you've got to war game and you've got to um, pass down the line what your intent is. If this happens, this is what I'm thinking we'll do, all right? And so back to um, trends and analyzing your business. So the first point in that last slide. So here we have. Um, a farm we bought in Western Victoria, and it was our thesis that we could significantly increase the stocking rate over a period, and from that we would get much better um, margins or much better profitability. So, if I just if I put up um, just one dot in isolation, you can only really compare it to your other farms that you can sh that you share your data with. And that's useful, but it's not nearly as useful as staying in your own lane and seeing the trend over time for yourself. So here we are, you know, and take this all the guys salt, you're going to be somewhere in that 10 day set of the hectare where we started, and then we went up to um, around 19 days set of the hectare. And then for those of you in the room saying, well, you overcooked it, but you went past and overshot the runway, we leased a very poor property next door here at the end of the drought. And that's why our DSC per hectare dropped down because that's an amalgamation of the very poor, planet, poor property that we took on. So why did you take it on? It had a body of feed at the end of the drought and we were able to stock it with um, cows and calves at $900. And so the strategy is to try and get higher and higher stocking rate per hectare, but the tactic that presented itself at the time is why um, the strategy looks a bit like, you know, doesn't look to be working then, but we'll, we'll give that lease away and capitalise those animals. And then, okay, how would I know I was wrong? I said that if we get the DSCs up, we're going to get the profit up. So here's our gross margin per hectare for our prime land, like prime <coughs> land enterprise on that property. So a decade ago, we're somewhere around the gross margin of 500 bucks. And then at its peak, it was a gross margin of just under 1200. And the line of best fits says we'll settle around somewhere around 1100. So that's that whole, here's my plan. 10 year plan, and then going back and checking it and making sure that we're um, on path. So, how does that pertain to resilience? The strength of conviction in your decision. You know, I've done it once, so I can do it again. And the team so that's Owen, Sergeant at Arms, and that's Kim who manages our coral place, and that's Tim hates sheep work. <laughs> that's the end of that's the final crutching day at Coralock. So again, with the individuals, you need a team that's on board with you. In my experience, it's one thing for me to have a vision, but if I haven't conveyed that to the rest of the team and they haven't bought into it, it doesn't work. So again, we're always looking to improve the team as individuals. Um, and so that's that growth mindset. I can't do it yet. I'm not good at Excel yet, or I don't understand PLs yet. I don't understand critical phosphorus rates yet. There's that whole, sure, I mightn't be able to do it now, but I know someone who can teach me. 
So I find that um, transparency is really important if you want everyone on board. So we share all our numbers with all our team members, no matter where you are in the team. Um, and we include our bank, our bank manager, or we include as far up the chain as we can get to come to our um, meetings. And our accountants come along, and our stock agents, and anyone else that we deal with. Um, we like to have people own the job. So quite often I'll just say to someone, I'll tell you the what and the why, and you work out the how, because I'm six hours away. So you just tell me how you're gonna do it, and if you're not resourced properly, we'll look at investing in that and getting it going. Um, similarly, all my team members have access to all the professionals we employ. So for example, we had a salmonella outbreak. We restored a wetland in Western Victoria. It's an amazing, it's one of the proudest things I've ever done. Um, Previous owner had put a drain through a 350 acre wetland and made an absolute hash of it. Um, and um, we, with the help of an um, environmental group, restored the wetland at now one stage, the last two years, I think it's carried 18% of all the brogal population in Western Victoria. There's all these species that are turning up, we wouldn't believe. But <laughs> nothing's all good, nothing's all bad. All the water birds have carried a heap of salmonella on the pasture around it. So we had an outbreak of death just prior to landing and the manager there rang me so I got a lot of dying ewes. So straight away I was thinking, oh, well, it'll be landing. You, you've just handled twinners too early to landing. Give them a, a bag and, and just hope that it settles down. So that was my gut response. But instead I said, well, you know Melbourne University, that's who we deal with. I want you to go directly to them. And I want you to come back to me with what they tell you and what you find. So to his credit, he had um, a vet there the next day, they do an autopsy, they said by, by Monday afternoon, the lab had said, you've got salmonella, you need to get them back in, give them all antibiotics. So what ended up being a 300 new loss, if it was under my management and I jumped in and taken the control of it, it would have been a, you know, a 2,000 new loss. <coughs> you have ownership of the job, letting people have access to your professionals and then coming back to you with their take home message doesn't mean that you don't circle back and double check that their comprehension of the uh, situation is is not you know is correct but you need to let people own own their jobs i reckon and so the other thing is we place a large emphasis on on character traits so in my experience skills are transferable someone can teach you how to weld Someone can teach you how to AI a cow, but you can't be taught to tell the truth. You can't be taught to get out of bed early. You can't be taught to pitch in and cooperate and help. Um, and similarly, on the same, there's an exception to every rule, but there's never an exception to a principle. We do not lie, cheat, or steal, and we do not tolerate those that do. And covers a lot of bases, or as Sandy Middleton says, the YouTube test. If, if it was put on YouTube and you were embarrassed, well, then don't do it. Or I like to use the wedding speech. If it was read out my wedding speech, and I didn't, and I was embarrassed, then don't do it. Uh, communication, so commander's intent. So we're obviously by the map at the beginning, we've got farm, we've got people working in our team, managing farms for us that are you know six, ten hours away from where I am. So it's really important for them to have um, <coughs> to, for them to be confident in what they're doing, they need to be clear on what the commander's intent looks like, what does right look like. So we're very big on making sure that everyone knows explicitly what my expectations are or what our expectations are. And um, and that's a function of being there on the ground. You can't, it's very hard. It's very hard to have empathy or appreciation if you're not there mixing it with people off and on. So um, you know, whilst we have a reasonably well, we, we have a reasonably large business, I still clutch the sheep for the table. So I'll be on a handpiece, not as much as everyone else, um, but I, I think it's important if you are going to have empathy and appreciation and, and be there, you need to pitch in. So for example, we had 200 mismustered mis lousy sheep in the hills, full of thistles, you know, two years worth of wool. So I and I shawl them ourselves. I wanted to point out that the salary I'm on Financially, we would have been better off to shoot the sheep than go to Wagga <laughs> because it was taking me so long this year. But... <laughs> and, then, and then you might find this um, strange, but um, we've, we've started as a group talking more about mindfulness and meditation and just 
being in the moment and really being aware of. So we're all farming and what have you, but it's our lives and we're in it. So you need to you need to be looking after yourself. So a lot of our um, you know, we we talk a lot more about um, our appreciation of the job and how we're feeling, and um, and we've, we've employed a few people to help. We've employed my group in particular to help us with that, and it's been really good for us. So um, there's a list of some of the resources. I've bastardised a lot of their ideas, but if anyone wanted to take a photo of that, and um, you know, this is a really good book. This one, The Logic of Failure, Recognising and Avoiding Error in Complex Situations. It sounds heavy, but um, it, it talks about some really good concepts. So it talks about the thermostat effect. So where we are today is often a function of a decision we made five, six, ten years ago. And when you're in a crisis, it's so easy to think that you're where you are because of a decision you made half an hour ago or an hour ago. But the actual situation you're in is quite often a function of the decision you made five years ago. Um, and they only talks about some other, anyway. Um, and then, does anyone know who Charlie Munger is? Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger? Yeah. So he can do a really good speech of the 24 psychological mistakes when investing. And some of them don't readily apply to farming, but I reckon one of the big ones that does is we all become decided with what we can lose and the mistakes we can make. And we don't ever put enough weight in on what we've pulled on. So I still maintain that I have pulled on more money and more profit so you go and buy a farm for five million dollars, and it's my it's my response as well. You know, am I doing the right thing? Am I paying five hundred grand over the money? What if it all goes badly? Maybe I could lose the five million bucks. You can only ever lose your investment when you put in. But the upside is unlimited. But when you're doing that, how many times have you got really anxious about will this go up two times, three times, four times? In twenty years time, you look back at I look back at farms that I didn't. You know, that I was losing bitter on, which is lots of them. I think mean, far out, that's worth whatever now. So it's, it's human nature to worry about the downside. And I'm saying be blase about it, but I think you need to be aware of what the upside is and what you're potentially foregoing as well. And it's all very easy to say that at the end of 20 years of land appreciation. But, you know, hindsight makes things look a lot easier than they were in, when you did it. I haven't bought a farm. I think one farm where I didn't stay awake the entire night afterwards worrying that I've done the right thing. And <laughs> questions and spelling mistakes. <laughs> and as an aside, it's a farm we bought where there was a school of thought in the district that says um, phosphorus and sulfur doesn't work here, you can't get your stocking rates up, so it's 800 mil rainfall, but yet the stocking rates are. You know, four DC per hectare, and that's what happens when you don't put phosphorus on, and that's what happens when you don't put potassium on. <coughs> so, you know, understanding your data. Why? Why is this data not right? What's what am I missing? Everyone's up. Any questions? <laughs> What's the so that, was, that was just an example. I don't think you can use this in other options. Yeah, so I'm a bit on the view. <laughs> uh, we just at the moment. Yeah. Leave a gap between your anger and what you're going to say next, Logic. No, no, it's just a, a statement. I'll say that we should have you as an annual promotion or the promotional speaker. I think the farmer can hold it. I reckon. Fantastic presentation. That really uh, questions what we're doing, what we're thinking, and yeah, no, it's very generous. Of you. Yeah, very good. Hi, any other questions? Sure, yeah. Charlie, what have you found your best strategy stress in drought? Oh, so that's a, yeah, that's a really good comment. So in my one of my points that I didn't speak to is he said is it legal? <laughs> <laughs> well that's an interesting point too. So I straight away as soon as I employed someone else, and I don't know. Perhaps you guys would like it. I, I played a bit of sport, a bit of footy, and I used to cheat. And, you know, you, you know, it's only cheating if you got caught, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so, and, you know, if you weren't cheating, you weren't trying. And then as soon as I employed someone else, stop all the cheating, because the fish rots from the head. So you got one rule for the boss, and then the real rule for the rest of us. So now we just apply all the rules, so we do everything legal. Um, so any one of those points is not setting people up to fail. So one of my best managers struggles 
to write particularly well. So his grammar is poor, his spelling is horrible, and I'm pretty sure his reading, he finds it hard to come. So if I get him to do a report for me, I will do it all on video. And he just gives me a video of it, so he doesn't have to give me a Word document or an Excel. Mm -hmm. So the point I'm making is don't set people up to fail. And in the drought, you've heard me talk about this before, Sandy, I find droughts really stressful. And I start counting how many new cardos I'm spending a week. So you know, if I'm, you know, the height of the drought, I'll be buying eight new cardos a week. So meanwhile, my wife's driving around the car with 450,000 k's out with kids chucked in the back and all the rest of it. And, um, and so what I do is I don't, I'll set the strategy, but I won't buy the grain. I delegate the purchase of the grain to someone else, so I'm not pressing the trigger. And I don't do the feeding. Um, I try and avoid doing the feeding because I'll go, oh, this mob looks all right, I'll just cut it back a bit. And inevitably that mob, the mob that gets skinned. So, you know, it's not really resilience because I'm avoiding the, avoiding the stressor, but I've recognised in myself that I don't handle droughts very well if I'm the one that's paying the money. And I'm the one that's watching the grain run out. So that's, that's one of the tactics that I use in a drought. Charlie, how far ahead do you look? Like in terms of your business or yet um, your direction, like do you look twenty years ahead, five years ahead? So we've got a fan, so we've got a, a stated position when I finish that the whole team knows about. So the further out we get, the less um, granulated it is. So it's a big picture, and it's you know it's um, it's sort of generic, well not generic, but it's big picture. So from that point of view, and then we work back down to ten years, five years, and then each farm manager will have well, this is the plan for the next fortnight, this is the plan for the next year, etc. with CapEx and what have you. And then with purchasing farm or with things like purchasing farms, I'll apply a discount to things that I don't like. So I don't like one trick ponies. So you know my Xanadu is a farm that can be all cropping, all prime land, all dairy, all but it's like it doesn't happen, right? But I'll apply a greater discount to say the farm at the current market <coughs> where it's over to Protein production or, or wool and then stuff to do protein production. But you know, try and have a, a longer term view. Yeah, yeah. So, talking back to that thermostat effect, I'm here, I'm, our business is in the situation it's in because of the decisions we made, you know, 14 years ago. So, 14 years ago, I went to the family and said, I reckon the property is undervalued. I think we should borrow as much money as we can and keep on doubling on nothing because I think. Property prices are going to increase. Was I dead sure that I was right? No, of course I wasn't. My point is, if you're the boss, you've got to have a view. How would I know I was wrong? Kept on checking. No, I think we're still going good. And so that's why we bought, got enough equity, bought again, and so forth. Does that mean it's right now? Has the data changed? Yeah. Yeah. Charlie, just to, uh, you've got your property stripped from one side of Victoria to the park. Um, why did you do that rather than say buying more country around Colorado and sort of spreading that maple mix and where yeah. the costs and things can lower it? Yeah. Not for whatever, I'm just saying what yeah. what made your strategy go so far all over the place? Yeah, yeah. So so nothing's perfect, right? So my Xanadu would be that I had all my farms in either Western Victoria or in northeast Victoria. So Coral was really hit this. So we'll have you know, a year of 220 mil rainfall or 260, and then we'll have years of 800 mil. And so, so, so again, that distribution, you don't know what you're going to start with. So I found coral quite lumpy. We, we do poorly for three years, and then we do well. If I was, and we were going to have to leverage to buy farms. So I didn't want to go back to the bank and say, you know, we've had three bad years, remember the spreadsheet I gave you when I pitched, which is at the end of that three years or four years. I found it. Whilst the banks say they understand it, when you push comes to shove, they don't. And so I was pushed into more higher and reliable rainfall areas. Also, I don't like a fair fight, and the farm and my neighbours at home are really proficient at what they do. Similar to Holbrook, right? You, Holbrook, when I go through the Holbrook region, I can look everywhere and go, oh, that's a good farm, that's a good farm, oh, this oh, that place is going really well, I'm going to talk to Hitsy or Tom or any of you, and I go, oh, that's a great idea. And as a group, because you're so good and property prices are high, you, get, you know, there's not there's not much margin. A new farm comes up, they run fully priced. Well, Coral is exactly the same. A new farm comes up and it's fully priced. And so your return on investment is not that much because the guy that or the guy or girl who's buying it, they're working on a gross margin. They've already got their overhead, to your point. And so they're going to beat me up every day of the week. So I was happy to get on my bike to find assets that gave me a much better return. Purchase, so a good job again. 
so I couldn't pay people properly. And so that is why it's not ideal, but that's how, that's why it's ended up the way it has ended up. You know, I, I don't want to be, you know, I don't want to be competing with you guys because you'll either beat me and push me that hard that when I get it, I go, because that wasn't a very good deal. I much prefer where you go hunting with people that have blood and eyes. So that, <laughs> Sounds callous, but that's how it works, right? And so the, the bigger question is, what are you happy to forego? So I'm happy to forego being at home, and I'll travel around. So it's, it's the mine, you know, when people say, oh, you know, I can't buy a farm, I can't get into farming, well, you can, it's just you're not prepared to make a big enough sacrifice. There's always somewhere where you can get a toe off, and it's just, you know, do you want to be here, or do you want to be somewhere where it's not so nice? And where did you start? How did you get to start? Uh, so again, um, character over skills. And we, you know, we don't have a perfect record. We have attrition. And um, Sandy and Tom have heard me speak about this. I'm pretty frank. We have a high feedback business, and we turn through a few. But then, you know, I've got team members who have been with me for over a decade, several of them. So employed for character, not skill. Enthusiasm. So I've got you know, my current team. I've got uh, <coughs> one, two that would be traditionally what you would call someone who came through an ag avenue. So one guy's a greenskeeper, one guy's a drug rep, one guy was a fencing contractor, fencing contractor in Sydney. And I met him. So the, yeah, that's that's my take on Star. And also, I like to think that apart from the ones I sacked or the ones that quit, I get a good referral. So if I'm, you know, if I was to um, be interviewing Laura, I say, well, listen, I'm going to check up on you. But here's the name and number of four people that have worked for me previously. How about you ring them and get, you know. I'm not going to ask them what they say about me. You ring them and see what they say about me and what you think. So that's kind of how I go. But I'm not the first to go by any stretch. By any stretch. How do you allocate time for the strategic thinking? Do you do that in your own time or with work time? Or business hours? Or? Yeah, so my job is to make myself obsolete. So yeah. one of my biggest criticisms of my own performance the last two years is that I've been on the tools too much. So, um, I don't know how you all feel, but you naturally fall back to where you're comfortable. So I'm quite comfortable on the tools, or quite comfortable looking at the numbers, but probably less com comfortable, particularly now, about where's that business going to grow. So it's just easier to make excuses for yourself to go back to where you're comfortable. But you know, ideally, you know, 80% of the time would be on the on the payroll doing and what's our strategy. But you can't, like, we're lucky, we've got a reasonably, reasonably large scale, and so I can, you can ameliorate all that, oh, that sort of time over, far more DSC, a lot of people can. And that's, that's the beauty of podcasts, right? I used to sit there crutching cheap or drenching in, my life is disappearing one bum hole at a time. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas now I can be sitting there listening to Black Swan or um, Unforgiving 60 or Influences, a good book I'm reading at the moment, Listening to at the moment, psychology of money. The day goes past, and you go, "Oh wow, Harvard! You know Harvard Business School. You can download that stuff." So you're gonna learn. There's a negotiating course at Harvard, and you can just get on YouTube, download it, and you can sit there listening to it. Well, I don't know, Tom. You're telling me. That you're listening to it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all that stuff there that you can do. Like, you just gotta have the maggot in the brain. And, you know that I'm not good at it yet. So negotiating, I'm not great at it, but I'm a lot better than I was. Oh, how much weight do you put on <coughs> benchmarking alongside your saying just measuring your own performance over time? Because uh, you, I take you, you touched on benchmarking. Yeah, so, so we've been benchmarking since 1999, and that's the Coral Farm, and then all the other farms are in a comparative analysis group, so we compare. So other people, not to see whether we're winning or not, but just to see where the opportunities are. And I really
really like those trends over time. So for example, our canola enterprise was probably getting worse when I first took over, you know, and then it's gone really, really well. And our wheat used to be our um, really reliable, resilient enterprise, and it is going, if you look at the trend, it's not improving at all. So that's one of our big worries. So I quite like that whole, you know, why is this bit of our business not going well? What, you know, where, what are we going to do to fix it? So again, that drove mindset. Do you benchmark? We were, but we we pulled the straps and even then it upset me so much that yeah. dropped it then got back to what I'd like it. Yeah, and so that was the other thing for me, and I know it's this, again, it's that whole um, Richie McCaw or Charlie Munger walking towards the issue. So mm -hmm. I find benchmarking in a drought my most valuable benchmark year. So, you know, it's human nature, we can all go well when it's going well with us, but examining when you go badly and really putting the spot like this and yourself when you go badly, both from a business perspective and, a, and your own behaviour. So during those bushfires, and I don't want to go into the detail of it, but I got criminally charged for something that didn't happen, and, it, and my name pretty much got leaked to Talkback Radio. <coughs> it's on the radio, you know, 44 year old man, this address, all my mates are up going, anyway, the whole thing got thrown out of court, but it was three court hearings later. later and the whole thing was just such a storm in a teacup. But I behaved, like I felt so, you know, I just wanted to tell the world it wasn't true and all the rest of it. And on, upon reflection on my behaviour and how I coped with it, I would now deal with that circumstance completely differently to how I did. So it's that going back and examining when the pressure was on and how you behave and going, right, well, I'm not going to do that next time. Next time I'm going to do this, the business is going to do that. So I think there's more to be learned in your failures or your cock-ups mm. than there is in your successes. Well, that's been my experiences. Fortunately for me, I've had a few of them, so this might get a better advantage over the rest of you. <laughs> I don't know, has everyone else had a similar experience? With their big jumps up at the bench of their mistakes rather than their wins? Oh, yeah. 